Good to be here on a snowy morning. Glad that everybody who's here got to make it. Um, worried a little bit when I saw the weather that no one would be here, but it's a good crowd for a snowy day. But today we're going to talk about uh, Jesus' plea for unity in John chapter 17. If you'd like to turn there, you can make some notes that we'll put up on the screen. But if there was a chapter in the New Testament uh, that I really wish everyone in the religious world could understand in its entirety, I'm glad that this is being broadcasted on Facebook, it would be John chapter 17. And it's because when, when Jesus prayed to the Father on this occasion, in this chapter, he asked for something that not a whole lot of people today are very concerned about when trying to follow Jesus. Jesus asked for unity among all believers. That's what he prayed for. And I want to talk about what that means in this lesson. Uh, the theme of Jesus' plea to the Father is that all who wish to follow him should be on the same page, religiously speaking. Sure, we'll have some differences of opinions on opinion-based matters, but when it, when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to the things we practice, we're talking about being in agreement on religious matters. Speaking the same things. Having the same mind, one mind together teaching the same doctrine, practicing the same religion. Someone might say, well, how could Jesus ask for such a thing? And I'd say, well, because he only brought one religion into this world in the first place. He only brought one message from the Father. And we're supposed to be united in what God said. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 talks about this. It says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bonds of peace. There is one body, or church, right? One Spirit, just as you were called in one hope for your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Notice that the New Testament declares there is only one faith in God's eyes. Right? And with all due respect, no matter how you try to say it, there is no other. There, God only set up one faith, and he brought it through Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Jude verse 3 talks about the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That entire set of teaching delivered through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. From day one, there was only one church, one truth, one faith. That's the way it was supposed to be, and that's the way it was set up. And notice that this faith, I like the wording here, is said to be once for all <coughs> delivered to the saints. Notice the emphasis there. That means it, it would be brought once, and it would stand for all time. Brought 2,000 years ago. Mankind would not be able to blot out this seed that was brought through Jesus Christ. It has not fallen to corruption after 2,000 years. No matter how hard some have tried in the past to abolish exactly what Jesus set up, all who have tried have failed to get rid of it. The Old Testament describes uh, what Christ would be establishing as a kingdom set up by God himself that would never be destroyed. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. That's what Jesus brought. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. That is, I don't, I don't care how many years go by into the future, Jesus says, my promise to you is that you will always have access to the words I'm bringing you from the Father. That will never go away. So the faith was once for all delivered. And we must be united in exactly what was brought from heaven. John chapter 17. Jesus prays that we all would be united in the words that he brought from the Father. In the different gospel accounts, uh, we can read about the disciples making ready for the Passover feast. We know that scene, uh, which we often refer to as the Last Supper. It was the last time Jesus would eat with his disciples until after the resurrection. Mark chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus said to two of his disciples, he said, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, be ready for us. That large upper room is the setting for this marvelous prayer that we're going to study from John chapter 17. I want to
wanted to title this le lesson, in the Bible we read of a beautiful prayer to go along with the, the song, but then I realized that song we sing uh, actually isn't talking about this prayer in John 17, but it was talking about Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that was a beautiful prayer. But for some reason, whenever I read John 17 and Jesus praying for unity, uh, my mind always pictured Jesus praying alone in the garden, as you, as you read in some of the accounts. Uh, but when I double-checked, John 17 was actually a prayer Jesus spoke in the upper room. I tried to find out where was he, and he was in the midst of his apostles, and they were witness. They were witnesses to this prayer. They heard it. When the prayer ends at the end of chapter 17, just to prove this, the first verse of chapter 18 says this. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, right, the prayer was over, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. So in John chapter 17, right, Jesus was not in the garden yet, but he was still in this upper room with his apostles. Nevertheless, this is still a very beautiful prayer in, in the Bible. John 13, four or five chapters back, 13 verse 2 talks about the supper being in the kept the Passover, the Jewish feast. And then John, in his gospel account, dedicates the next five chapters to the words spoken in that upper room that night. Most of which are words not written in the other three gospel accounts. It's exclusive to John, a lot of what Jesus says here. In this room, Jesus, of course, institutes the Lord's Supper, as we've just observed, uh, with the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. This is where uh, he gets down and washes his disciples' feet. It's where Jesus tells Peter that he's going to deny him three times. It's where Jesus tells his disciples uh, that he knows one of them is going to betray him. In verse 31 of chapter 13, Judas leaves the room to go out to betray Jesus. So for the rest of chapter 13, through the rest of chapter 16, four, four and a half, or three and a half, four chapters, Jesus gives one last teaching session to the eleven faithful apostles before they take off to the Garden of Gethsemane together, where Jesus would be betrayed into the hands of sinners. I wish we had time to read all of chapters 13 through 16 together, but we're going to look at chapter 17 uh, today. So Matt, I want you to just picture the scene. Jesus has just given four chapters worth of teaching, and he's been communicating with his followers, chapters 13 through 16. Judas is gone. He's already exited the scene. And these are some of the last words that Jesus will speak until after the resurrection. Sometimes, probably the last words with some of his twelve. In John chapter 17 and verse 1, we see a transition in Jesus' speech. Jesus transitions from addressing the eleven apostles. He's been talking and teaching them. And he shifts his focus to addressing the Father in heaven. So Jesus starts praying in their midst. So I'm not sure if you've ever thought about the context of this prayer. But here's one thing I want you to consider. The 11 apostles are listening to every word spoken in this prayer. I never really thought about that, but they were right there with him, and he shifted his focus and prayed to the Father. And Jesus is going to be praying about them. And, and he's going to pray for them in particular. He's going to address the Father on behalf of the apostles, first off, and they're listening to every word. I think there's something in this prayer that Jesus specifically wanted them to hear that he didn't just pray to the Father in private, but he wanted the eleven to hear. Also, think about this. You know, this prayer is Jesus' dying plea for all of his followers. Right? He won't teach after this. Not until after the resurrection. Sometimes people might ask you, you know, if, if you knew you were about to die, what would be your final words to your friends and loved ones? What would be your prayer that you would leave for this world? What would it be? You could leave this world with one last statement, one last set of words. What would you leave for everybody? If it was your dying request, I'm sure it would be important, right? And the prayer in John chapter 17 is Jesus' dying plea for his followers of all ages. This is what he wants. This is what he's leaving the world with. Jesus' dying request. So 
let's read carefully. We're going to go straight through it. Uh, some of Jesus' last words before uh, he was betrayed only hours later. So John chapter 17, verse 1. And, uh, we're not going to get all the way through the chapter, but we're going to read most of it. So in verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. Right, that word manifested means to make known. I have made known your name, Father, to the men whom you have given me out of the world. Right, these apostles, these eleven men. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. So of the eleven apostles who are still in the room with Jesus as he prays, Jesus says, Father, I made your name known to these men. You gave them to me. They've kept your words thus far. The eleven have kept your word. Verse 7. Now they have known, these apostles, they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So if you want some points for this lesson, point number one, Jesus acknowledges this truth and says in his prayer, I have spoken to these men, the apostles, all the words which you have given me to say to Number one, Jesus only spoke the words given to him from the Father. That's what Jesus spoke. John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I, uh, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. John 14, verse 31. As the Father gave me commandment, so I do. John 15, 15. All things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Right? He repeats. He's already said this in the upper room in John 14, 15. And now he's repeating it in the prayer. So as Jesus brought an entire body of teaching, he started bringing the faith, laying it down. He taught about so many different things. Righteousness, sin, Salvation, worship, he taught about marriage, about anger, about being peacemakers, being merciful, turning the other cheek, all of these different teachings. This whole doctrine, this whole religion, every word of it was drawn up by the Father. And Jesus spoke what the Father commanded him to say. That's it. Point number two of this prayer. These Here's number two. These 11 men have believed every word. They believed Jesus was sent forth from the Father. They believed he was speaking exactly what the Father had given them, had given him to say. And the Father gave these men to Jesus as followers. Jesus said to the Father, these men were yours, you gave them to me, and now they've kept your word thus far. Now look at verse 9. He said, I pray for them, Father. Who's them? I'm praying for the eleven right now. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world at this time, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I'm praying for the eleven apostles. Verse 10. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Right? If they belong to me, then they belong to you. These eleven men belong to us, Father. Verse 11 says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these 
are in the world. And I come to you. So break that down simply. Jesus said, I'm no longer in the world. Right? He's, he's saying, shortly after this, after all <coughs> said and done, I will not be here in this world anymore. I'm not going to be staying. Secondly, for these 11 men, they're going to be staying. And you know, they're not leaving this world just yet. But I'm going to return back to you, Father. So Jesus will leave. The apostles will stay. Jesus goes back to the Father. And now the rest of verse 11 is the major theme of the whole lesson. Okay? He says, Holy Father, here's his request, here's his prayer. Keep through your name those whom you have given me. That is, work, you know, work your divine providence through these 11 men. Keep them faithful. And now listen, that they may be one as we are. Okay. So these are the three points that we've covered so far. Jesus just said, Father, I have spoken all the words that you've given me to say. Number two, these 11 men have believed every word. Number three, I pray that these 11 men may be one as we are one. What was Jesus praying for in this plea? He was praying for unity among the 11 apostles. That's what the first part of this prayer is all about. I want them, I want these men to be united. And of course, they would have some help miraculously through the Holy Spirit from some of the teaching that was being given. But he's saying, you men, look at how my Father and I are one. Observe that. Right? Look at the life of Jesus, compare it to how he is with his Father. We are like-minded. We speak the same words. I'm speaking exactly what the Father is telling me to say. We have the same values. We walk together in perfect harmony of mind. Nothing's different. We're not divided. We speak the same thing. In the same way that I walk in unity, in harmony with my Father, you are to do the same thing with one another. Walk in unity, in harmony with one another. How could they do that? Well, the answer is by just speaking the same words that Jesus gave them to say. Relayed from the Father, came to Jesus, right? They would all be speaking the same thing. Jesus spoke what the Father spoke. And the apostles would speak what Jesus spoke. And if they all spoke the same thing, they would all be unified, united. United, unified in everything, just like the Father and the Son. Verse 12. Jesus continues his prayer. He says, Father, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you have given me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. Right? Judas is gone, but we knew that was going to happen. right? Verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Right? Because of my words, they, have, they can have joy. That's part of what's being left with them. I'm, I'm leaving them with the words. Verse 14. Let's get it there. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. And so already they've hated the apostles. Because they believed your words, Father. And they will continue to be hated. As long as they teach and believe your words. They're going to be hated. In verse 15, he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Right? My prayer is not that you pluck them out and take them straight to heaven with me. Right? Not that you take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. Protect them as they go along. Keep them from the devil. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. And that word sanctify, of course, we know means to set apart as holy. Set them apart from everyone else. How were these men to be set apart from the rest of the world? What's the verse say? How were they distinguished? Well, it's because they would follow the entire set of truth that was given to them through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through the Father. Set them apart from everyone else by your truth. Your word is truth. Verse 18. As you sent me into the world... They still communicate to the Father. As you, Father, have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself 
that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Right? So I came to this world distinguished from everybody else as holy. Why? Because I spoke your word. I spoke the words from the Father. That's what set me apart from everybody else. That's why they want to kill me. That's why they don't like me. I spoke your words, Father. In the same way, my apostles will be distinguished too. Because they're going to be speaking the same thing. The same exact message, the same faith. Verse 20, here's where Jesus prays for the Davison Church of Christ. That is, he prays for everyone who would afterward believe because of the words spoken through the apostles. And that would include us today. Verse 20, he shifts his prayer towards the other believers. He says, I do not pray for these alone. Who's these? The apostles. Right, this entire chapter, he's been praying particularly for these 11 men and their unity. But now in verse 20, he says, I do not pray now for these alone, but now also for those who will believe in me through their word. So when the apostles preach heaven's truth, I pray for all that all of those who believe in me through their word, that they may be unified. So listen to how he says it. I'm praying that they all may be one. So first the apostles be one, now that they, everyone who hears them, they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. you know, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one as just as we are. So look at the points of Jesus' prayer again. Number one, Jesus spoke to the Father. I have spoken all the words which you have given me to speak. Number two, these 11 men have believed every word. And now I pray for these 11 men that they may be one just as we are one. I pray that they speak the same thing. And now I pray for all those who believe through the apostles' word that they may be one as we are one. So do you understand right here that Jesus prayed for unity among <coughs> his followers for all time? Amen. For all time. Is Jesus giving, a, is he asking for something that's not possible? No, he's not. It's still possible today. In, in the same way that Jesus and the Father are one, Jesus prayed that the apostles would be one. In the same way that Jesus and the Father are one, Jesus also prayed that we would be one. How was Jesus one with the Father? Because they spoke the same word. Jesus was like-minded with the Father. They agreed together. Walking hand in hand, they spoke the same thing. Jesus was sanctified because he spoke the word from the Father. Jesus didn't change the Father's word. Jesus didn't alter his teachings on any topic. He said, gave exactly what the Father told him to say and how the Father told him to do it. But Jesus spoke exactly what was to be given. How were the apostles to be one? Well, they would do the same thing that Jesus would. They, they would only speak the words of the Father, which they received through Jesus and then through the Holy Spirit. So I, I want you to pay attention to the line of things here. Um, pay attention to how the Bible teaches that God sent the truth that we have in our hands today. How did, how did it get from the Father to us? Listen to these four simple steps. If you're taking notes, just jot these down. Number one, Jesus, we've been talking about this, Jesus came and spoke what the Father spoke, number one. So the words originated with the Father, Jesus came speaking exactly what the Father said. Number two, Jesus said that he would send who? the Holy Spirit, to guide them into all truth and bring to their remembrance all things that Jesus had said to them. So number two, the Holy Spirit came speaking what Jesus spoke. And so Jesus spoke what the Father spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke what Jesus spoke. And now the apostles. The apostles only wrote down what the Holy Spirit spoke. And now number four, we are to speak the same message. It's the same thing. Right? What we have to understand, what we have to show people, is that we have access to everything that they had access to in the first century, teaching-wise and, and religiously. We have everything we need to be unified in this truth. All things pertaining to life and godliness had been given in the first century. And if we keep this in mind, uh, 
uh, with every religious topic, then all believers can be speaking exactly the same thing. I think that's something we all understand. We're trying to get the world to understand this. We can speak the same thing about salvation. What must I do to be saved? We can speak the exact same thing about how we ought to worship God. We don't have to guess. We don't have to draw, you know, maybe you could do it this way. No, it's plain. We can speak the same thing on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. What sin is, homosexuality, all these different things that everyone's so confused about. Like, what should we, how should we stand? Well, the Bible tells you where you have to stand. And that's where we have to be. Because we have the answer book. Some people are busy studying the questions. We're busy studying the answers. Right? We have it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. However, many people think unity among believers is simply unattainable. Not possible. We can't. You know, they, they don't believe that we can all speak the same thing. And maybe in a humanistic standpoint, I don't think everybody would agree to speak the same thing, but it is possible if we would like to be unified in everything we speak. You know, and people will argue, but you know, after all, we're all fallible humans, and we all have our different religious opinions. There's no way we can be united in what Christ is teaching, just like he asked us in his prayer. But here's the trick. I think we understand this concept. If we all speak only what the Bible says on, what, on religion, throw away all of these teachings and practices and creeds that were originated from uninspired men and not God, then we would obtain unity. right? Because we still have access to the unaltered seed, which is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, the word of God which lives and abides how long? Forever. My words will not pass away. We still have access to them. That was Jesus' promise. We can be unified in those words. But you see, what many people in the religious world want to promote today is the idea of union and not unity. I want you to understand the difference here. Because they're similar, but they're not the exact same. And Jesus was asking for unity, not just union. Union is simply, here's how we would define union. <coughs> is the act of uniting two or more together, making one. That sounds good, right? And that is partly what Jesus was commanding, but that's, he asked for more than that. Sometimes this happens in a time of war, okay, where two countries who are enemies of another, and they're, they're at odds, they will have a common enemy, <coughs> and they unite together to form a union. Okay? There's not unity between those two countries. right? They're still opposed to each other. They, they're, they're not together, or they're not in harmony, but they share a common goal. And so they're able to look past their lack of unity to form one army and one union, right? So they agree, we'll, we'll, we'll get along, even though we don't agree with each other. We don't walk hand in hand, but we agree with one thing, we hate that country over there. But you see, unity is different. Unity carries along with it more than just two or more being together. That's, there's more to unity than that. Unity is defined as this. First part of this definition sounds a lot like union. Unity is the quality or state of being, of not being multiple, so it's oneness. So yes, Jesus was asking for that. But listen to the second part. A condition of harmony. Right? Accord. One accord. I've heard the difference explained using this illustration. Maybe you've heard it. If you take two cats, tie their tails together, and throw them over a clothesline, you have achieved unity. You, you have achieved union, but you have by no means achieved unity. Okay, do you see the difference? Unity is not only about uniting two or more together, but it also carries with it the idea of harmony and oneness between the individuals involved, right? Unity says we are not opposed to each other in what we stand for. We're not against each other. We're not divided or at odds in what we believe, but instead there is harmony, a oneness, a likeness of, of mind. We have the same mind. So you see, that is what Jesus asked for religiously. That's what Jesus was asking for in his prayer, unity. Not this, okay? 
That's not what Jesus is asking for. This is actually a very accurate picture of what the religious world is trying to do with Christianity today, is it not? I think that's a perfect picture of all the different religions united together without agreeing on anything. That's a mixing pot of the denominational world. Everyone in the religious world today, naming the name of Christ, they want to try to stand together as believers, right? We're going to walk hand in hand, united, and act like, oh, you know, you're okay, I'm okay. As long as we both believe in Jesus, it doesn't really matter what else we teach or stand for. But when it comes down to doctrine, and what everybody truly believes in their own separate corners, and how they practice, and what they do, and each group is utterly opposed to each other. Right? In, in so many different ways. Nobody can achieve unity with another religious group while believing and teaching different things. You cannot do it. That is what Jesus is talking about. Right? There is by no means unity among 40,000 different Christian denominations that exist. So even though many of these different groups have an attitude of, uh, you know, let's just agree to disagree. I understand we have our religious differences. Look past the, our conflicting belief systems and join together in Jesus' name. That is just completely the opposite of what Jesus asked for in John chapter 17. Let's close by showing exactly what Jesus was asking for with how the New Testament defines unity and being one. Okay, Listen to how the New Testament defines this. So let me give you five points in this definition. Here is unity that Jesus was asking for. Number one... <clears throat> Religious unity means, here's what Jesus wanted, speaking and teaching the same thing. I don't think there's a better passage than 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul said it so plain, he's, he's begging them. He says, now I plead with you, brother, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that by his authority, that you all speak the same thing. Now again, I ask, is, is he giving a request that is unattainable? I'm going to ask that you all speak the same thing about Jesus. That's not possible. Well, why is he asking for it? By inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I ask and plead that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. And that's clear. Number two, religious unity means holding to the original doctrine. That's the only way it can happen. That's the only way we can be united with one another and with God. So not straying from a, the exact set of teachings brought by Jesus Christ, administered by his apostles through the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, says on the day of Pentecost, so here's day one right, of, of the church. He says, they all con And they all continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship and breaking bread and prayers. Verse 44 says, Now all who believed were together and had all things common. Had all things in common. Right? So at that point, we understand no divisions had formed yet in Christianity. There was just one church, one set of teachings, and all who believed, it says, they were together. That was before Satan came and tried to divide everybody. They had all things in common. Why? How? Because they stuck solely to the apostles' teachings who had the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Right? Don't change it. You have to keep the doctrine the same. This message is from heaven. 2 John, verse 9. The Apostle John wrote, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Right? This is so simple. If you forfeit Christ's doctrine, his teaching, you forfeit Christ. They're a package deal. Acts chapter 5, verse 28 is a great passage. We see that the apostles were, were spreading their doctrine everywhere that they went. And the Jewish high priest complained. He said, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with what? Your doctrine. Your teaching. And intend to bring this man's blood on us. Right? Some people today try to act like, oh, teaching the doctrine was never important. 
Right? You, you guys put so much emphasis on what you believe. and what, That is exactly what the apostles are doing. And, and it, they, they say it doesn't matter what you believe, what you teach. Well, that, the apostles didn't think so. And they went about and, and filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. They were all teaching the same thing. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, Paul talks about following carefully the good doctrine. Verse 16, he says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Chapter 1, verse 10, Paul warns about any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. He says in chapter 3, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 1, 13, Hold fast and hold on to the pattern of sound words. Hold on to this. All right, so what they were speaking was very distinct. It was very specific. So much so, Paul said in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, he said, Now I urge you, brethren, now here's what I want you to do. Note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn. And do what? Avoid them. For those who are such, those who change the doctrine, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, if anyone comes along and they're speak some, speaking something contrary to the original doctrine that you learn, they're not following Jesus. Sorry. So I said, man, what we teach is important. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17 is another good passage. Paul wrote to Corinth. He said, for this reason, I have, I have sent Timothy to you, Corinth, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ. Now listen to the phrase, as I teach everywhere in every church. All the churches of the first century, you know, you go to Ephesus, you go to Corinth, they were preaching the same gospel. They weren't supposed to change it, they weren't supposed to mess with it, but keep it the same. And they did it in every church. Number three, religious unity means this, not dividing into different groups because of different teachings. You can't attain unity that way. On some days, the Presbyterians meet in a different place than the Catholics. The Lutherans meet in a different place from the Baptists. The Jehovah's Witnesses meet in a different place from the Mormons, etc., etc., etc. And I was asked, why? why? Why is that? Because everyone divides in their own little different groups based off of their own little different separate doctrines and practices. They're all teaching and practicing in a different way. That's how we distinguish them from another. So I'll just read 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 again. Paul said, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That's not denominationalism. That's completely the opposite of denominationalism. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So what's going on in the religious world today is not from God. It's from man. And our plea, of course, in the Church of Christ is to put out all man-made titles and teachings and practices and let's just be Christians again and just go by the Bible. Right? So don't be a type of Christian we got to show the world. You know, there was no labels of, oh, I'm a Catholic Christian, I'm a Presbyterian Christian, I'm a Lutheran Christian. No, they, if you plant the Word of God in the heart of a sinner, up pops a Christian, not a type of Christian. And so if you go by just the Bible, you'll just be Religious unity means this. I wish I could talk a little bit more about this, but it means being of the same mind. Romans 15, 15 says, Be like-minded toward one another, according to Jesus or Christ Jesus, that you may be, that you may with one mind, with one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, I, I, I kind of think of the example of when uh, Aaron Gallagher came up here, what's interesting is we had never met him before, and you know I called him once or twice, and he comes comes here, and we are exactly on the same page with Aaron Gallagher. How in the world he lives in South Haven, Mississippi? How is that that he can come here? We can talk about marriage and divorce. He'd be like, Oh yeah, that's what I believe, and that's what I teach. We can talk about salvation, baptism. Musical instrument, whatever it is, it's not that we have to call to a headquarters over in Utah or something that we get the answer. How can we be speaking the same thing and have the same mind if we live in two different places? Well, it's because we're going by the same book. 
the same God-given New Testament. And if we stick to it, it doesn't matter where you are. So that's what's cool. Is when we travel around, sometimes you got to be careful, of course, but you can walk into a church of Christ, and if they're going by the Bible, they'll be doing things the exact same way. They might have a different order when they do the Lord's Supper and things, but we're all on the same page. We all think the same way. You can talk to somebody and understand, yeah, you got it right. You're on the right path. Number five, religious unity lastly means agreeing on God's teaching. I think a really good passage that really sums up unity, and here's God, what God said in the Old Testament. In Amos 3 and verse 3, God says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? And what's interesting about this passage is who God was talking about. Is he's talking about himself and Israel. And he's saying, can, can we walk together unless we agree? You can't, you can't walk with me, God says, unless you agree with me. And so two, you know, two different religious bodies, they could agree with one another. But unless, we're, unless we agree with God, we can't have true unity. Okay? We have to agree. If we both agree with God, then we agree together. So that's what the Bible teaches. So just like Jesus spoke, exactly what the Father spoke, that's what we have to do. So that's the lesson. Hopefully we can strive for unity and teach this to people and show them how simple it is if we just go by the Bible. So you have to hear the gospel if you're not a Christian. Believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess him before men. And be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. So remain faithful in the If anybody would like to come forward for any reason, please do so. Always.